And now, a News Channel 13 special presentation. Alzheimer's, sharing the journey. With your host, Jerry Gressinger. Hello and thanks for joining us. Since the start of the pandemic, people around the world have followed every development, breakthrough and setback in the fight against COVID-19. Each of us learned what the symptoms were, how to avoid getting it, what to do if we did. Now imagine if we were as informed about other diseases. Over the next hour, we're all going to become more informed about a disease that is terrifying in a whole different way. One that causes brain cells to die, robbing patients of mental functions, even their memory. And if you thought Alzheimer's was something that just targeted the elderly, you're in for a surprise. We have a panel of experts that will be joining me in just a moment, but you're also going to meet Chris and Sherry Davies, husband and wife, patient and caregiver. I spent a day with them at their home in Saratoga County, and the first thing we talked about was how their Alzheimer's journey began. And I'm a coffee guy. I drink coffee. It's, you know, it's, it's my, my bloodline. All of a sudden, I started realizing I was going over to the refrigerator, grabbing some half and half, walk over to the counter to put half and half in my coffee, and somebody had already put half and half in my coffee. And I'm the only person awake in the house, so clearly I realized it was me, but I didn't remember doing it. And that started happening, I don't know how regularly, but enough where it, it, it was starting to, you know, like I was aware of this, like what, why am I not remembering that I've already put, I know this sounds innocuous, this, you know, but why am I remembering or not remembering putting uh, cream in my coffee? And then I mentioned it to my doctor at a physical, I think, and he said, okay, that's something we need to, uh, to maybe look at and, or, you know, maybe next year or in six months when you come back, if that's still happening, I can't remember exactly how that worked, but that was the very first indication for me. So my son was a junior in high school at South High and I had already been noticing like that he was like, if I would leave the house and I'd be like gone for an hour and I'd say like, I'm going to Target, I'd get back and he's like, where have you been? And I'm like, I went to Target. Like, and I was thinking like, why aren't you paying attention? And I'm thinking, all right, like we're really busy. And he was, he had his own business as a private investigator. I was working. And so we had a lot going on. Our son played sports. And so I figured, all right, it's just, you know, like busy lives. And didn't think much of it. My son came home his junior year from his AP psych class and was like, Mom, I think Dad's got Alzheimer's. Here's a pamphlet we learned about it in school today. And I was like, your father doesn't have Alzheimer's. We're busy. It's like, you know, he's just not paying attention as much. So I didn't think much of it. I didn't know he went to the doctors and talked to him. But the next summer, we go camping with six families up at Fish Creek in the Adirondacks. And one of our really good friends said to me, there's something wrong with Cress. And I was like, like, what are you talking about? And so he was like, he's, he's telling me stories like over and over, doesn't realize he's told me, he's saying the same things over and over again. And I was like, well, you know, I don't think too much of it. And he's like, no, I think there's something wrong. So I started kind of paying attention. Didn't see too much. Cause I think, cause I live in it, it, it wasn't really as noticeable for me. But then in August, we went away with his parents to the lake and a couple of things happened. I had switched up our duffel bags to a different color. And so he asked me like seven times, like, where's my black bag? And I'm like, no, we have red bags. And so it was like, it happened multiple times in like an hour. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So I kind of checked that. And then his dad, he was supposed to give his dad some money for the, the house. And his dad's a big jokester and was like, no, you didn't give it to me. And so Chris was really upset because he couldn't find the money. And I'm like, okay, he doesn't really get upset like that. So I was like, okay. So I went with him to his primary care physician. And that's when I heard that he had already been having problems. And it was pretty, for me, I was like shocked because I was like, so not only has this been going on, but like he's already aware of it. And so from there, um, he did a mini mental status exam, couldn't draw the clock correctly. Um, had some issues with that, so that was really shocking. So immediately, I'm a social worker, so I went into like social work mode and was like, all right, we're getting a neuropsych and we're doing this, 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 and this, and it started pretty quickly from there. And a lot of it is because I knew kind of what to do. Um, so we got the neuropsych, and at that point he had mild cognitive impairment, and that was in December of um, 2018. And by the time we got into Albany Med in that June for an appointment, it had already progressed enough that he was already in the category of younger onset Alzheimer's. Sherry and Chris Davies are with us in the studio today. I want to thank you both for joining us. We have a whole panel of people, but I'll introduce each of you uh, one at a time. And so I'll start, obviously, Sherry, you are Chris's wife. And Chris, you're 54 years old with younger onset 
Alzheimer's is what they call it. That is what they say, yes. Uh, that's right. And next to him, we have Beth Smith Bowen, Executive Director at the Alzheimer's Association of Northeastern New York. We have elder care attorney Tim Casserly, and we have Dr. David Hart, neurologist at the Alzheimer's Center at Albany Med, and Chris's doctor, right? That's right. I've got everything correct. All right, guys, thank you all for being here for this very important program that we put together today. And, you know, what I want to start with is I, I mentioned you're 54 years old, and I think for a lot of people that is going to blow their mind as, as to who an Alzheimer's patient is. Younger onset, I'm sure it wasn't the first thing you were thinking of either. Oh, absolutely. And, I, yeah, I, I completely agree that the average person when, isn't going to picture me when they're when they hear about a, a, a person with Alzheimer's. Yeah, and um, even when I got to your home and we spent some time together, I, you know, speaking to you, speaking to you now, you do not seem to be like the traditional patient that we think of. And, and let me ask some of the other panelists here. You know, I think a lot of people out there will say, wait, he's 54 and, and he's dealing with Alzheimer's already. How common is this? Yeah. It's not as common. Of course, um, age is the greatest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. And so as we approach the age of 85, we really see the number spike to nearly half of Americans um, over 85 have Alzheimer's disease. Much more uncommon to see it in somebody in their 50s and 60s. But perhaps Dr. Hart could add more to that. Yeah. Um it, it is something that takes people by surprise, and the fact that when people have Alzheimer's disease early on, they're, they still have great conversational skills, they're, they remain articulate, they present themselves well. So it's easy for people to blow things off. We heard on the, the tape that Sherry was talking about, well, we're busy, and so he's just distracted, and sometimes that, that's what's going on, but uh, sometimes there is a problem underlying that. Certainly less than 5% of the people who have Alzheimer's disease are in the early onset category. And I would think that for whichever age at which something like this sets in, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, we're talking about the coffee and the creamer, Chris. And I think I said to you that day, I'll say it again now, there are times, you're not much older than I am, I'll walk up the stairs and by the time I get there, I forget why. Yeah. Why did I come up here? And I think a lot of people have experiences where they have some forgetfulness. And, and for you, like you said at first, you just kind of discounted it. At what point, how do you know the difference between common, forget, common forget, forgetfulness and when it gets to a point where there's something else potentially going on? And this could be anybody who jumps in here. Well, I think what we see in the office is that, um, that people, people have busy lives. There's a pandemic going on. You've got kids. You've got parents to worry about, as we were talking about before coming into the studio. So yeah, people do forget things, and a lot of that is benign. When we start seeing a pattern of that, we start seeing people forgetting more important things. We start seeing that along with that, people are having some difficulty with other cognitive domains like processing visual information, making spatial relationship decisions, um, judgment, problem solving. That's when we really get a, an idea that there is some global cognitive process going on and it's not just that people are living too busy a life. We also say to people um, that commonly if people develop a pattern, as Dr. Hart said, then we want you to talk to your doctor about it. In addition to that, if that memory change begins to affect your functional ability, so in other words, if you were a, a devoted bill payer your whole life and everything was always on time and then suddenly you're missing payments and getting late notices because you forgot to pay bills, then that's a functional effect of your memory loss and one that needs to be addressed by your doctor. I think that that Chris and Sherry should really be saluted for how quickly they raised this issue with first the primary care doctor and then immediately when Sherry became aware reached out to the folks that the specialists at Albany Med to get Chris evaluated there not everybody does that far too many people wait far too long yeah and I think you know you mentioned in the clip that we saw being a social worker and you went right into that mode right. uh, but but even initially you said looking at some of the early signs oh no we're just just busy. So you probably followed that same progression that they were just talking about going from this is nothing to well maybe this is something. Yeah and I think for me a lot of it was because outside people were starting to come to me that there was issues so like when our son did it right I, I still had that memory back in my head that he had earlier on said something that there was an issue right I discounted it at the time but when we then had friends who were like who've known him forever were like hey there's a problem then I was like okay, maybe it's not what I think it is, right? And so let's kind of figure out what that is. But 
I don't know if it might have taken me longer if other people hadn't come to me who knew him and said, hey, you've got some sort of issue going on, because they noticed stories, you know, repeating things that were not normal for behavior for him. Yeah, I think, I think identifying it is certainly the first step, and as you say, going out and asking questions of primary care to, to get something under control, or at least to understand what's going on. You know, uh, obviously an Alzheimer's diagnosis can change everything. We saw that and we were with you, and I want to go back to a clip, something where we were able to talk with Chris about how so many things have changed since getting that diagnosis. Let's listen to that. The, the, the one thing I, I guess I should have mentioned maybe is I was, I've always been an avid reader. You know, I love, I love you know, uh, bios, crime fiction, and now I, I can't remember what I read, so I haven't read a book in well, a year anyway. It yeah, just, it's been a couple. Yeah. So you get through halfway through the book and you're not? Oh, I don't even get halfway through. You know, I'll, I'll read 50 pages and, you know, and then realize, oh, I, 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 two days later, it's like, I don't even remember what, I don't remember what I just read uh, two nights ago. Come on, Tillman. So since the time of getting that diagnosis or when you first started noticing, you know, some symptoms and such, how, how have things progressed for you both? How, like, what do you notice? What do you notice? Well, certainly my, t t to, to my assessment, my world has, has shrunk to basically the house for the, for the most part. I have a lot of good friends that are constantly, some, some that live up here and, and most of them are from down in Dutchess County still. Guys are coming up, you know, once or twice a month for, for, for breakfast, for lunch. So I still get a, a good amount of time with, uh, with my buddies, you know, from growing up and, and high school and college. And I can't remember what your initial question was as to why I, uh, I got there. Just uh, about how things have, have sort of changed for you in the past, you know, four or five years since getting the diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, Certainly, uh, I'm dealing with a depreciated status at, at my house. You know, I mean, I don't make decisions anymore. Those were difficult for me at first. You know, I mean, if I didn't make a decision, we certainly discussed a decision, and that may exist now on small uh, items or issues, but it's, it's, it's definitely different. You know, it's, uh, it's palpable at times. It's like, oh, you know, I used to be able to make that decision myself, and, uh, and I understand why I, I don't now. We've certainly heard about older adults struggling to give up certain responsibilities and independence, I guess, to go out and do things, and, and in your case, to be a decision maker in the household. And it just makes me wonder, uh, maybe dealing with the same sorts of changes to their lives, but are there, are there different challenges in, in diagnosing older patients versus younger patients? Is it difficult to, to be able to say to somebody in their 70s or 80s, th this is what you're dealing with versus someone like Chris in his 50s and then taking them on the path from there? I think the, the process of, of diagnosis, you know, the whole conversation that occurs with a patient, finding out what, you know, what their daily context is, where they're having problems, uh, and, and how you assess them is very similar for somebody who's younger versus somebody who's older. Um, I think where the big differences come in uh, is where people are in their lives. Uh, and so, you know, Chris and Sherry, you know, he, he was running a business and, and that's not something that he's able to do any longer and you know, my younger patients have to give up what they're doing. Uh, sometimes they need some help at home, but their spouse isn't able to, to do that because the spouse now has to be the breadwinner and has to be responsible for you know, covering the house financially. Uh, and that's a, a much bigger problem for, uh, for younger patients uh, in some ways than it is for older patients. Mm. And, and Chris, talks, just, I'm sorry. Can I just add to that? <clears throat> well, often that's where we get involved because you do have to start taking over financial decision making, right. maybe even health decision making. Right. So we're going to have um, documents in place like a power of attorney and a health care proxy. So you're directing someone to act for you if you can't do that. And the sooner we see the family, the quicker we get that in place because if it progresses, then we can't get those things signed down the road. Right. Yeah. There, and, and there are other practical issues that emerge too, right? So we so often hear from folks that have younger onset Alzheimer's disease that are denied Social Security benefits, which is when we reach out to folks like Tim to say, we've got somebody here. Social Security isn't used to seeing claims from 54-year-olds with Alzheimer's disease. So it almost universally is denied on the first round. Yep. Um, and that's a challenge. And maybe, Tim, you can you can it is. It's frustrating that. because you have this diagnosis saying I'm on the path to disability and there's Social Security saying, sorry, you're not going to get it. But like Beth says, routinely they just deny it. So we just appeal. Yeah.
Right. And we went I, through that. Yeah, we actually that. went through yeah. that. That's they denied us, and we were like, we, you know, we're seeing a, a neurologist, Dr. Hart's amazing. Like, we, we have documentation. How are you, you know, how are we meeting with this person for 10 minutes who's not a doctor, who's like, nope, sorry. And, you know, it was shocking to me, like, that those things happen. So, you know, I was like, what's going on? And so, yeah, we had to get a lawyer, and we reached out to Elise Stefanik. She got involved, and because they were not, they were like, nope, he's fine. I was like, wow, this is crazy. And I think, too, I don't think we've touched yet on, on what it was you were doing for a living where, you know, your cognitive ability to remember and all of that was so important. Tell me, tell us about that. Right. I, uh, when I, I was in law enforcement in Dutchess County, I retired, moved up here, and I uh, started my own private investigation business. And when you're interviewing people and taking statements from people, you have to remember what people are telling you, right? So that's, you know, yeah. that, that was... For a while, after I had been diagnosed, <clears throat> I was still doing okay. At least my own self-assessment, I was doing okay. But I realized, okay, th now I, I need to be fair to you know, the people I'm working for, and perhaps I should just stop this business. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later, but I want to say right now, as you mentioned it, I mean, really impressive and I think inspiring that you were able to step back and make that call because that has to be so difficult for so many people. And again, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but I, I want to actually, before we get too far away from it, we talk about early diagnosis, getting involved early with physicians, with, with uh, elder law attorneys, end of life planning and such. You know, for people to be able to make that early determination as to what's going on, I'm just wondering how, how early of a a diagnosis can we get? I, I was looking online. There is some, there's, there's a gene or something that can, can tell you that you're prone or likely to develop Alzheimer's. Is that correct, Dr. Hart? Well, so there are three genes that uh, are responsible for what we call dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. That accounts for a little less than half of 1% of patients with Alzheimer's disease. So it's a very tiny fraction. Those are uniformly people with early onset disease much earlier than Chris. Uh, a lot of these people present in their 30s or in their 40s. So if you have one of those genes, then we know you will develop Alzheimer's disease. There uh, is a gene, the ApoE4 gene, apolipoprotein E4, uh, is a cholesterol-carrying protein. And people who have the E4 variant have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's. But they may not. They may have some other process occur. So it, it's, not, it's not a causative um, uh, it's not a determinant gene, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. So we don't like to use that as a test because you might have an E4 gene and, and not have Alzheimer's, or you might have Alzheimer's and not have an E4 gene. For the huge majority of people that have what we call sporadic Alzheimer's disease, there are probably genes that are risk factors. Um, it seems that from some of the genetic studies that have been done, often patients have one or two uh, gene mutations that put them at higher risk, but there are many, many people in the population who have those same mutations who do not develop Alzheimer's disease. So we're still trying to figure out what it is that's the causative factor there. It's, it's for the most part, not a uh, genetically determined illness. Yeah, so, I mean, as, as much as we'd like to say we're gonna find a way to figure out if we're going to get it, it's still really impossible to tell. You know, Chris, when we were with you, we talked about uh, the drugs you've been prescribed, the treatments that you had been working with, uh, and I want us to play that clip now because that'll get us into the next segment of our conversation, so let's yeah. hear that. Yeah, so we were actually at the back end of all the medications. Um, he started with Aricept when this first started, and the Aricept was great. It gave us about eight months of a really flat, no um, losing any skills, things like that. So it was not really- never came back, but at least right. it was a plateau, Stop. you know I mean? Yep. And it was really nice because for a time it was like you didn't really have to worry too much. And we hit about maybe six and a half months and then I could start to tell, all right, we're starting to kind of lose some skills again. Like, you know, kind of some memory stuff was starting to kick back in. So at that point, um, he switched over to, we've tried since then, there's been three other medications that he's tried and we've basically gone through what they have. Um, the, they haven't worked, nothing's really worked for him. Some had some pretty bad side effects, gastrointestinal stuff, um, but they weren't, st they weren't making any kind of real stoppage. Um, they're not made to reverse symptoms, they're just made to kind of stop them in their kind of tracks for a short period of time. All the other medicines they had hopes for that didn't work, and obviously this is not, it's still in that process, and I'm thinking, you know what, I, <laughs> what are the chances that this, they've been working on this for 30, 40 years, uh, what are the chances that this is the one that's gonna do it? And I'd rather just just be 
peaceful here and uh, not be uh, being a guinea pig running down to Albany all the time. That's a lot to think about a difficult decision to make, saying that I'm, I'm done with the medication. And I want to ask you, Dr. Hart, um, you know, listening to that, you know, I know there's been some new medications that have come out, very expensive. Where, where is it, I guess, in the, the grand scheme of things where medication is in terms of what it can do for Alzheimer's at this point? At this point, there are four symptomatic meds for Alzheimer's, the, the meds that Chris has been on, and these are medicines that have been around for 20 years or more, which do give a little bit of a bump in memory. Some people see that as a temporary improvement. Some people see it as a, a short plateau. Um, what we've been trying hard to get to is medications that really slow the process, slow progression, um, perhaps someday reverse the, the changes. Um, so there is one medicine that was approved last year, uh, and that's Agihelm, which um, is a, a monoclonal antibody that removes a protein that builds up in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. There's a normally occurring protein called beta amyloid. It builds up in abnormal quantities in the Alzheimer's brain. And this medicine has been shown to be able to remove that protein. It um, showed a very robust power to do that. Um, the effect that it had on clinical function, however, was not as clear. Earlier this month, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, who makes the decision for what Medicare is going to cover, decided that this medicine should be covered just in the context of clinical trials. And we're going to do more investigation with this agent and try and see if we can you know, show definitive proof that it either does or does not have a clinical benefit. Uh, and we're also working very hard to come up with other agents that you know, work in that way or in, in other mechanisms to, to try and affect this process. So since we've got you both here, you've, you've said, uh, I'm done, I don't need to keep trying all these different meds, but you're talking about the potential for this new one to, to do some good, hopefully. What's the conversation like when you, when you have an appointment together and uh, you know, he's mentioning this, and is, is it hard, Chris, to continue to say no, or do you hear that and say, well, maybe it's worth a try? No, I, when it was, we saw Dr. Hart three weeks ago, maybe? In December, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he brought it up, and, and like I said, I, I, I believe when we were talking, you know, when I was talking to you at the house, uh, they've been working on it for a long time. Uh, I doubt they're going to get it done, you know, in, in, to, in order to help me. And, and I don't want to sound like I'm being very selfish. I mean, it's, they're, they're going to help everybody with Alzheimer's. But yeah, I just at this point, uh, I decided, you know, I'm just going to stop going down, you know, as a, as a guinea pig for now and just kind of in, in, in enjoy while I still have a, what I like to think is a decent, you know, uh, ability to function. You know, just that anything in my past is, 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 is dying quickly. But as long as I can still enjoy my day to day activity, you know, I'll just stick at the house and, uh, and do that for now. And we had serious conversations with not just in December, but this has been, I think, our last three appointments. We go every six months with Dr. Hart, and we've had serious conversations about this over the time period of back and forth of how could it help? What could be the side effects? What are things that we want to do? And I think that, you know, part of for me, which was difficult to kind of accept was just that there is a point where Chris has to make his own decision on this. He is informed. He's still aware enough of does he want to do this or not. And so, you know, respecting his decision that this is what he's now decided, right, just it's one of those things he has very little control over a lot that goes on in his life. And so with guidance from Dr. Hart, us having multiple conversations about it has come to this decision. And so, you know, there, there has to be a point where also he can make his, some of these still decisions for himself. Um, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'm going to show some more clips, uh, particularly about how you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm done with the medication, but it doesn't mean that you're giving up. There's still a lot that you're doing to get the most out of your life and to stay as healthy as possible. And we'll also talk about the difficult but necessary conversation you had very early on about the end of life planning piece of this. We'll be right back. Oh yeah, okay. Chris works out four days a week now, you know, at least four days a week where he's working out. And you know, so that piece I think because he's always been really physically fit has probably helped with some of the decline because that's part of what we've talked about with Dr. Hart is that exercise and diet really is, is a huge part of it. Can't hurt, right? Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. I mean, and so he's so physically fit. You know, when you look at him, you you don't think there's anything wrong. You don't see it. And, you know, he's he's a good talker. So, you know, a lot of times under short circumstances, you may not even realize when you're talking to him that there's something wrong as well. Totally, yeah. I'm experiencing it right now. Yeah. Like everything is right on the level. You know? Right. And again, you guys are here in the morning. So morning, he's much more, his brain hasn't been really active throughout the day. You can see by four or five o'clock, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, he's got to take a nap because he's just used yeah. so much energy. Four or five days a week. Uh, I definitely take a nap for, you know, 40 minutes, an hour. And uh, I, I have to just mimic what you just said there. You do not seem, he does not seem like someone who's got much wrong with him at this point, because as you say, you, you're up early and, and you're, you're, you're doing well, but then also the, the physical fitness part of it. I mean, we were, we were in your basement with you, saw you on the treadmill working out, and that's something you're really, really focused on. I'm just curious, how big a part of someone's ability to manage this disease comes into, you know, is, is their physical fitness? So I, w I would say a couple of things about that. First of all, we're learning more and more in the field of Alzheimer's disease about lifestyle interventions as possible risk re reducers in developing dementia and Alzheimer's, and I'll defer to Dr. Hart to talk more about that. But I will also add that I think that Chris is doing so well on a day-to-day -day basis because he's engaging in activities that he likes and because he turns to his care partner for advice when he needs to. And I think that the combination of those two things are central to doing really well with this disease, except the support and the help from the people who love you, the people that surround you every day, and do the things that you enjoy. The fact that you surrendered reading when that became too challenging, there's some advice that we provide about that. Perhaps magazines are easier than books, and a lot of times we recommend to people that they read a book that they once already read because it doesn't rely on that ability to store the new data, but rather a reminder of something you read once before. So there are strategies for that, but the other strategy is surrender that activity and pick up something else that you can still do well. Yeah, and it does sound like that's, that's what you did. And Dr. Hart, did you want to chime in on the, the physical fitness aspect of that? I would imagine, too, for older patients, that will be more challenging. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are two parts of it. First part is that um, physical fitness, physical exercise, um, the amount of exercise that you do in midlife is a strong predictor of what your dementia risk is in later life. So anybody who's watching the show, who's worrying about their parents, you know, be thinking about yourselves a little bit. Get out there and, you know, do the spin classes or the treadmill or I... I usually give people a, a list of increasingly odd uh, activities to try and get a laugh out of them to you know, break the tension a little bit. But you know, the, the idea is to get up and, and do something, and that really can help lower your risk. For patients who are affected, now we think about Alzheimer's as a memory disease, but it's a brain disease and not just a memory disease. So people have problems with visual processing, they have problems with coordination, they have um, problems with motor function. Uh, and so if you're more physically fit, you're, you're protecting yourself against some of that decline. You're protecting yourself from the emergency room visit for the fall when you hurt your shoulder or you broke your hip or something like that. Um, so I think that's uh, an aspect of it. And the, the third part, just briefly, is that when you do exercise, you get your heart rate up, you, you're sweating, you're, you're releasing uh, some proteins that make the brain stronger. You're also just increasing the alertness, you're increasing the attention, the processing speed of the brain, and so it has a direct temporary effect in that way as well. When we were at your house, we also talked about, uh, you know, we talked about physical fitness, but we also talked about nutrition and being able to plan for meals because that is a whole other process that you need to consider. And uh, we were there around lunchtime. We were able to see you interacting with your dog. So I want to take another clip now to talk about, well, to see a little bit of him maybe, but also to see what, what life is like here, what life is like as far as even just getting nutrition to an Alzheimer's patient. So let's hear that. You know, I work three days a week, and so that works out perfect. We've got a really good setup where, you know, Chris doesn't cook anymore. So, like, on, I work Mondays and Tuesday nights. So Monday, he has some sort of leftover or something that we've had. So he knows exactly what he can throw in the microwave. He's good to go. 
And then his cousin who lives five minutes away, she takes him Tuesday night. So she makes sure that he's fed on Tuesday. They watch the Rangers or whatever's on if there's something on Tuesday night. So not only does he get, I don't have to worry about dinner and him cooking, but he's got that socialization at her house every Tuesday night. He knows that he's going to be at Shannon's house to go see her. Then I'm off Wednesday and Thursday and Friday I work days. So I'm home again for dinner because at lunch he eats cold guts, whatever. It's we don't have to worry about cooking. So we've got like a really good system going. And it does sound like a really good system going. And I'm wondering, is this the type of system that families who are dealing with someone who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's have to figure out? Is, is, is the whole process of, of being fed, finding meals, making food, is that something that becomes another struggle? Sure. Absolutely. And routine is so critical. Um, people really do best with a routine. Sherry mentioned that um, Chris can look forward to being at his cousin's every Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. When you can cement a routine in place in your home, it is so helpful for the person who has memory impairment. And as far as the importance of nutrition, I mean, what's uh, how, how big a part is that we talked about the physical fitness of it all? This is another piece of that puzzle. There are a couple of aspects there. Eating something that resembles the Mediterranean diet or the mind or dash diets, which are all pretty similar. Less red meat, more fresh fruits, nuts, vegetables, more seafood. That lowers your vascular risk and that lowers your dementia risk. We also know that when you eat a lot of sugary things, when you have that boost in, in blood glucose, the brain doesn't work as well in that situation. So trying to stay away from the sweeter foods, which can be a struggle because a lot of times when people are developing a dementia, they're also losing some of their sense of, of smell and therefore their sense of taste sweet things still taste good because that's mediated by the tongue instead of the sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that can be a, a real fight to keep people away from the, the cookies and the cakes, which are a nice treat, but not, not great for the brain. You know, as we're here talking about uh, physical fitness, proper nutrition, I just, we talked about this briefly and I'm just remembering it now. I, I said to them, I said, what, what's, the, what's the end of this story look like? What's the end of this journey look like? We talk about Alzheimer's being a, a terminal illness. I mean, how does it come to that point? We talk now about forgetfulness. How does it get to the point where we're looking at the end of, of a patient's life? What, is, it, is it the Alzheimer's that takes it or is it other uh, conditions that come as a result of it? It, it depends on the patient, but uh, as I said, this is a progressive brain disease and not just a memory disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, so people, in addition to their memory problems, develop other kinds of cognitive problems. People develop mobility problems. They're not moving around as much. They're at higher risk for developing blood clots, getting a pneumonia, getting pressure sores. They're at higher risk of getting a urinary infection. Uh, and people eventually become increasingly debilitated. A lot of times, uh, especially with older patients, they develop more difficulty swallowing, uh, so they can't get the nutrition that they need, and they're also at high risk of getting what's called an aspiration pneumonia, when you know food or drink goes down the wrong pipe, as we say. And, uh, and that can be a, a very dangerous situation. These folks are very, uh, very um, at risk for problems like the flu, now the, the pandemic, coronavirus, can, can be terribly uh, debilitating and can be fatal for patients in this situation. And you know, and I think for something as mysterious to so many people as Alzheimer's, I think that's important because you say this is not just a memory issue. This, this impacts so much more. And I think people who haven't been touched or haven't witnessed how this progresses, like, like myself, don't realize that right away. Right, absolutely right. So, so how important that we're able to share this. I, you know, you talked about uh, the, you know, the ability to just can t kind of stay sharp and have something to continue to you know, occupy your time with that's enjoyable. And you talked a little bit when we were at your home about uh, eye-hand coordination and keeping certain skills sharp and, and how you had to convince your wife uh, to allow you to get something sort of a retro style it was, way. It was not easy to convince her. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as, a, as a fellow former gamer of the 80s, I, I can see the struggle you had. Let me show people about what you were able to bring into your home to provide some enjoyment at, at, at a time when you could use it. Let's, <laughs> let's see this. I'm down there every day, here, right? Because you're looking at my at my my world, you know, right here. What, what is it? What is it? It's a lot more than I needed, right? I mean, <laughs> it's an old school tabletop arcade game, like Pizza Place. Right, like the, like you would like we had back in the '80s. Except I think there's 3,600 games on it now. I was only interested in about 15 when I was looking into it. 
I really only play four or five of them. I just play the stuff that we grew up with in, you know, in the 80s, and I'll, I'll spend an hour or two down there every day. There's nothing wrong with that. Because yeah. here I am, this is, you know, I can talk to my dog, but he never talks back, so, uh, you know. Right, the do dog has else. been, I'll tell you, like, we, our dog, you know, I think that's been a great thing for Chris, too. You know, again, he's not an emotional support animal, you know, like by, you know, training, but it, it really is. I mean, the two of them are, my, the dog has serious separation anxiety. That, now. that Chris, is true now, you yeah. You know, it's, it's actually become a bit of a problem for the dog when Chris goes out somewhere that Chris isn't with him anymore. He's been so accustomed to me being here every day for almost the whole day. So every viewer wants to go visit Chris and Sherry. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, when I was with him in his basement with that video system, I was like, uh, we could hang out here yeah. for a few hours. This would be fine. No problem with that. A little missile command going on. Yeah. 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 But, you know, I think it speaks, too, to what you said that, okay, if certain things can no longer bring you the same level of joy, find something that does, that works, and that's certainly what you did. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And I can say that, you know, I initially, yes, I was like, how, you, you know, you're having difficulty remembering how to do things like using the remote for the TV, things like that, right? How are we going to get this giant game system that you have to learn? And so I was concerned just from a really practical standpoint of like, we're going to invest all this money and like, are you really going to be able to use it? And so we made it work, you know, we labeled everything. So for after, you know, several months, he was able to figure out all these things. And now, you know, he can can go down there in the winter when he can't go outside and do things and it gives him just the joy itself but I also see like how he tracks these if he plays centipede how he's tracking the little guys that that go down where I'm like I'm, I'm scoring like a thousand on it and it's terrible and he's scoring like 80,000 right so his hand-eye coordination is it, he's just practicing over and over again and so I can't help but think that's got to be helpful. And if I had to guess, I would guess that you played this game. Oh, certainly. Often. Yeah. yeah. So what we tell people all the time is think back to those things that you enjoyed doing, that you repeatedly did because they may be stronger in your memory and you may be better able to do it, which is why we see people so often, even in the advanced stages of this disease, relate so well to hymns or patriotic songs or those things that that they did occupationally for 50 years of their lives because it's built so deeply into their memory banks. So this was the perfect thing for Chris to yeah. select. I was gonna say, it sounds like an outside the box sort of way to, to kind of give you something to do and something to engage with, but really, as you're describing it, what, what a great way to keep that, that cognitive ability and remembering things that were so strong in that memory, you know? That's yeah. despite the convincing it took with your wife. And, 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 <laughs> and, and I, for, I can't remember if I mentioned it the last week, but, when I, I, I prepared, uh, you know, a, a, a proper introduction to my, my idea, right? You know, I knew I couldn't just, you know, throw it all out there. <laughs> and I know what Sherry was thinking. She's like, this is ridiculous, but wait a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm like, okay. And she thought she was going to wait me out. I was going to forget <laughs> about it. And I wouldn't bet against that, you know, if I was somebody else. But I was like, oh, no. And... To the day, 365 days later, we sat down. I said, "Well, it's been a year, and now I want to order that arcade machine." And she, she was convinced. My best friend kept reminding me. And, I'm sure and someone he, was he involved. He did not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure somebody else was involved. But it was, but it really did turn out to be. And I can say, like, it did turn out to be such a great thing. And and again, I do agree. I think it is something that he played in the '80s, right? And so that if it had been a new game, I think we would have had a different outcome. And so finding these old school 80 games actually were a great idea and I hadn't really thought of that that it, it really and I, relate back. And I'm sure that sort of thing will be different for different people. You know, right. They'll find something that speaks to their youth that they remember that they can still be engaged with. And I think for you, that's that's what that was, yeah. which which was great. As we talk and we, we laugh about this, there are also some, some very serious conversations that you guys had to have as well. And I'm going right. to go back to one more clip where you explained to us how very early on, surprisingly so, and I'm sure surprising for yourselves, you talked about end of life planning. Let's listen. That was something we did really early on. And I think for me, I would say that's probably a really important piece of what we did because Chris was able to go in and talk while he was able to think about what would he want, right? So like having a, having a DNR is 
something you have to talk about and it's really difficult like that was a really hard conversation of like what do you want what happens and even within that we've had conversations so he had said you know right off if I'm on a ventilator like I don't want to be on a ventilator for for an extended period of time if they think it's not going to help right take me off of it so we had to have really serious conversations about what that looks like and I think doing it ear really early on when he could say what do I really want is important because yeah. I knew what he wanted but to hear him say it and obviously to a lawyer is much more important. So Tim, I'm going to look at you now. I'm going to say, talk to us. You just heard their description of their experience. Well, for one thing, you guys are better than most clients. You actually talked about it. <laughs> a lot of people, they come begrudgingly to the lawyer's office because we're maybe a notch or two above dentist. <laughs> people really aren't looking to come in. But we often have to lead that conversation to bring out what are your wishes. And a lot of times they can't articulate what the wishes are, but there's documents that let you pick someone to make those decisions for you. So just down the road, God forbid, you have to make a hard decision like that. I've already picked my spouse to do that. A lot of people too assume that just because it's my spouse, they can speak on my behalf. Well, that's not the case. You need that healthcare proxy in place. You need the power of attorney. If you go to the bank and just say, I want to withdraw this money, it's in my husband's name, my wife's name, you need a power of attorney to do that. They're not gonna let you just take that. Even though in the past the assumption was my wife's going to do all my banking, which is the case in our house. It works fine for me. But down the road, if she doesn't have the legal power to do that, then she's going to be stumped. And then we're back in court, maybe, to get the documents put in place that would have been a lot cheaper had they chose to do it themselves. Done it ahead of time. So congratulations, yeah. you guys. And Jerry, I want to add my congratulations at thinking about this early. because. At the Alzheimer's Association, I would say once a month, we get a call from a family, and they weren't thinking about it early. And understandably so, right? Because you're not thinking about those later, later yeah. moments at the earliest points in this disease. But we need people to be thinking like that because we get these calls and they're often from people who say, I'm not sure that my father can talk about his wishes anymore. And perhaps Tim can comment on what the options are if an individual is no longer able to articulate their wishes. They're not good. Yeah. A lot of times, they know they want to come in and do that, or they should come in, they don't want to. So a lot of the challenge, and Beth has been helpful, getting the people to the office to get that process going. But having said that, if they do nothing, then we have to go to court and do what's called a guardianship. And we have to petition the court, basically ask the court to declare this person incapacitated. And it's a very expensive, embarrassing process even because it's in public and you're going to show that this person is completely diminished in their capacity and can't get anything done and then the judge is going to pick someone else to take care of things. So whereas early on you have control of the process, now we're handing it over to the court and it's very expensive to go through. Another reason to do the planning early is because it's not only end of life but it's during life because so many people, Sherry's a social worker, she probably has a lot of insight into what services are covered by insurance and what services are not, but many people don't know that. And another call that we frequently receive at the Alzheimer's Association is from families who thought that their home health care coverage was going to be a Medicare coverable. And that's another thing that, that Tim helps families understand what the payment mechanisms are for their care. Yeah, there's different programs out there. A lot of people, like Beth says, assume Medicare is going to pay for things. Medicare is really your health insurance, so it's not going to give you any kind of long-term care relief whatsoever. So we like to see if someone has long-term care insurance, and I think you guys... We don't. You don't? Yeah. All right, I won't go into that. Then. Yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> that's, one, that's one payment source is the insurance, if you can get that early on. Now, if you have a diagnosis, you're not going to get that kind of insurance. But if you do it in advance, that's a good planning thing. Down the road, if the care progresses to the point you need much higher care, like a nursing home, Medicaid becomes the program that will pay for it. The tricky thing is the in-between, where you use your own funds for so long, but with memory care, that can go on for years and years and years, and if you run out, we don't really have a program that can kick in to pay for things. Yeah. So a lot of the planning we'll do is almost financial planning more than legal work. You know, it's, uh, I think with any disease, you know, we say earlier is better, early to diagnose, and certainly early to involve someone who can help make these plans like you're able to do, like you were able to do because you thought of that. This stuff is all really difficult. It's hard. I can see where people would face the situation and not want to look at the end, yeah. but I think what you're saying today is so important for them to hear that use the opportunity while, like you say, you're not as much of a decision maker in the home anymore as, as you were, but use the opportunity 
when you're still able to be a part of that decision to get it done. You know, there is another element to all of this that we want to get into, and we will do that in just a moment when we come back, but that is talking about the primary caregiver and making sure that that person is also taken care of. So stick around, we'll be right back. Self-care has been a really big part of managing all this for me. I go to therapy, so that's, I think, essential for everyone. I've recommended it to every single person in our family because even though I'm married to Chris, and yes, I'm going through it much, in a much different way, everybody's still dealing with the loss. Um, that anticipatory grief that's happening is throughout our whole family. Um, so I go to therapy. Um, I get a massage once a month, sometimes twice. Um, I go to, you know, I get, I go to acupuncture. I go to, for fun, um, once a month I go with my friends and we go up to the Country Witch up in South Guns Falls and they do, it's one of those board and brush places. And so I love that. It's, it's fun to do and I go with a bunch of my friends and so I get to go out and, and have that socialization. You know, and that's really such an important part of this too because the caregiver has to obviously be in a good place to be able to help the person dealing with Alzheimer's. But Sherry, you're a social worker. We talked about that earlier. Were you able to, to still put yourself in the social worker role when it was you who was now the, the caregiver to your husband? Or was that harder to, to it, figure out? It was harder at first. Um, in the beginning, I didn't do as much self-care. And it became really apparent, you know, probably a couple years in where I was like, OK, I'm struggling. And like, this isn't working for me. Like, I'm doing everything that I need to do for. I, I at that point, still had a full-time job. I was trying to take care of Chris, our son, and, and all these things. So I really wasn't taking good care of myself. And I could tell, just physically, I didn't feel well. My mental health wasn't going as great as it should be. Um, and I just didn't feel like I was as present as I needed to be. And so made a lot of changes that included leaving my full-time job and, and opening a private practice to work part-time. I can still do what I love, but do it in a way that's beneficial for myself, my clients, my husband, my family. Um, and then doing some of the smaller things, like I said, like getting massages and things like that, and staying connected with friends, doing those. It, it became clear to me that like I had to do that because in the end, if I stop taking care of myself, like how am I going to take care of him? How am I going to take care of anybody else? Yeah. yeah, that's the major consideration. And I think it's important to point out too, I, we didn't get into this yet, but just to mention briefly, you, you know, you went through the whole home and sort of made changes to everything. Like even, even I noticed uh, the, the dog uh, bowl with the food and everything, and there's notes and you know, move it over to dogs been fed in the morning. Dog. Right. So you went through an entire process right. of, of kind of, uh, Alzheimer proofing, if you will, the right. whole house, right? Right. And a lot of that is just, you know, I worked in a behavior management program, so a lot of those things I just brought into my home, but it's it's difficult to know what you need to do. So I'm always feel like I'm playing catch up where we our dog started gaining weight and we couldn't figure out why. Well he was getting fed by Chris and me because he didn't know if he had fed him, so we're double feeding the dog. So he made a little chart like with a, a move over tab, right? Did he get fed or not? Um, you know, leaving lights on things like that. Yeah. So I had had like little notes and tabs and things that I had around the house, but it is playing catch up all the time because what our circumstances are might not be somebody else's and trying to figure out what those things that we need to, to fix. Yeah. And not every caregiver has the insight and the, right. the knowledge that Sherry has. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we have a fabulous tool for home safety and modification that goes through a household room by room. So that if you are not somebody that's worked in behavioral health or understands these things, you can look at that tool and literally go through every room of your house. As the disease progresses, for example, I remember a spouse calling me and saying she just looked into the bathroom one day to to find her husband brushing his teeth with her face cream. Oh. So even just the, the confusion of products in your home. So all safety and home modification items um, all on one convenient form to help families navigate that part of the journey. And I use that. So I, I went early on, I met with the Alzheimer's Association. They came to meet with us um, and I sat down with them for quite a while. They came up to Saratoga and it was amazing. And that's, I highly recommend that to anyone going through it because they sat down with me and like, here's some things. So like, I didn't intuitively know to go to the lawyer 
lawyer, they're the ones that told me, you got to do these things. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And so safety things, I look through that, what applies to us and what are, there are a lot of things I do intuitively, but there are, I use the Alzheimer's Association, their resources all the time, because I never know what I'm, you know, what am I going to come up with next? What are some things I might come up with? And so that gives me a good idea, like just doors, like I've read the, about like how sometimes like our basement door might become a problem. So what do you do for that? How do you put locks on it? Or how do you put decals over it that looks like a bookcase? So those are all things that I've used from their website and their, their resources that they have available. And I think it's interesting. I keep hearing you say it every time we talk about something that worked out well or was successful, right. you use the words early on as you start. So that again, reminds us all how important it is to, to not sit back and wait or put it off to get started immediately. I also want to add that um, many of our caregivers are much older than Sherry, and and so the self-care component becomes as important for them or sometimes more important because they have other health issues and all too often we find people that neglect those health issues so i was so happy to hear sherry talk about the positive things that she's doing for her mental and physical health and i hope that all of my other caregivers and care partners hear that and and take that same advice because um it's it's a heartbreaking thing to get a call at the association and learn that one of the people that you've been serving lost a care partner. And it happens all too often because care partners give so much of themselves, they neglect themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering too, as difficult as it is for someone to, to work through this and there are services available, are there things like support groups where the caregivers can come together and share their stories and feel strength, at least in numbers and hearing other people's experiences? Absolutely, we have support groups throughout our 17 county region, um, meeting virtually right now, but um, in person as well. We have educational programs where people will often meet hear speakers like these two gentlemen um, and learn a lot about what they need to do and so we have many many ways that we provide support to our our constituents there's a message board as well which I like so the message board on the Alzheimer's Association so if you had a specific question I've gone on and looked up things there before where I where I didn't necessarily need to be in a group at the time but I had like certain things that I wanted to know and you can just type in what your question is and it'll lead you to where you need to go and so I found that really helpful a lot of great resources and I'll tell you we speak about resources and even in the support groups the sharing of information that I think provides strength to some people and uh, you know those of us here who have worked on the interview at your home and even seeing you here today have all remarked it is so incredible that you've been so open the both of you something I said to you at your house and you, and you had spoke to me then about why you felt it was important and why you just decided you know what we're, we're not going to keep this a secret we're going to share it and I want to share with people what you told me then so let's let's play that. You know, I never thought I'd be the first person to live forever. So, it's like, and so far, I've had a good run. So, I don't dwell on my lack of future. I, I just kind of enjoy the where I am now. And I've always, well, at least for now, I still have my my history, my memories of all the the crazy stuff of and fun stuff I've done with with my crew that I still have. You know. And I think for me, it's harder. I think I have a much harder time of staying in the present. So for me, it's a really active like trying to be like appreciative of the moments I have. So that's been a bigger struggle for me because it is really difficult. And so one of the things we did decide early on was that we were gonna be really open about it and talk about it. And I think that's really helped us because um, we've watched kind of family members and, and friends of the family who've gone through things, cancer, whatever. And a lot of times they really kind of close themselves off and don't talk about it. And you don't really know what's going on. And I just felt like the more people that we can talk to and that we know even just originally it was within our family and just being really open about it, but it became doing more things like this. Um, I think that's really helped us to just kind of feel like making sense of all this. I want to ask uh, the three of you on our panel, uh, the, your experience with people being open and, and their willingness to talk about what's going on in a situation like this. And certainly, as we said, most of the patients who come in, most of the clients who come in looking for help through something like this are going to be older. They're going to be in their 70s and their 80s. Do they have a harder time talking about something like this and, and, and sharing their stories and, and thereby also enjoying the strength knowing that they're not alone? I would say in, in my office there's wide variation. There are, you know, there are still families who come in and they say, don't use the A word. We, we don't want to talk about it. We're just going to talk about it as a memory problem. 
Uh, and I think, you know, in general, we've come so far from the paternalistic days of medicine of, you know, 40 and 50 years ago where we would just pat people on the back and say, well, this is okay, you'll, you'll get through this. I, I think we have a responsibility to patients, to, to their dignity, to explain to them what's going on and let them be aware of it and let them, you know, be an active participant in, in planning for what is to come. Um, we have patients, we have, I have, you know, patients like Chris and Sherry who, you know, are, are just right out there and, you know, we, this is the problem, we're going to grab it by the neck and we're going to deal with it the best way that we can. And I think that's a much healthier way of dealing with it, but it's a, a spectrum. Yeah, we see the same range of families. I mean, some are very willing to deal with it and some don't want to say the A word or yeah. deal with it at all. So it's, you kind of just feel out what they're willing to do. Also, too, you want to stress that the fact you do some of these documents, like the power of attorney and healthcare proxy, you're not giving up control yet. So we tell them this is for the day you can't handle things. And so they still feel empowered that they can take care of their own affairs as long as they can. So we try to make that clear. Yeah, and I would say that sharing is so helpful um, for so many people. The, the folks that attend our support groups, um, they all say to us how much they benefited, learned from, and were supported by people that are walking in their shoes, right? And nobody walks in your shoes unless they're walking in your shoes. Mm -hmm. And so people can guess and they can be empathetic and kind, but those folks that are walking the same journey together often have a unique way of supporting each other. And then every year, well, except the last year or so, there's a caregiver conference put on. Maybe you can talk about that's the most phenomenal resource for so many caregivers. It really is an amazing thing. We have not been able to hold in person, of course, because of COVID. But, you know, putting 500 people who have been impacted by this disease together in a room with experts that provide um, information for these folks. It's so interesting. A couple of years ago, we had the conference and I saw two gentlemen come up and embrace each other. And they had met at the conference the year before, hadn't spoken one word in the passing year and spent the whole day together at conference again. Really is an incredible bond to watch. You know, and I just want to close and we're short on time and this is probably a loaded question, but just if you can, is, is enough being done at the national, federal level, uh, you know, internationally researching Alzheimer's and, and trying to figure out where can we go from here to start making more strides? I, no. No, I mean, there's been a tremendous increase in funding for Alzheimer's and neuroscience research, and that's great. We have a long way to go to get the answers that we need to be able to, you know, help people like Chris and Sherry through a problem like this and, and bring it to the point where it's a treatable problem. And I just want to point out again, uh, we've said it a few times, but I think the two of you sharing your story, Sherry and Chris, uh, the way you have, uh, hopefully will touch people who are seeing this and encourage them to speak about it. I imagine you may hear from people uh, who want to thank you or speak with you or kind of lean on you a little bit yeah. just to find out how they can move forward as you have. So thank you so much. You. I want to thank all of you for being with us as well. Uh, you know, I, we were saying in one of the breaks, could we do 90 minutes? Could we do two hours? <laughs> because, uh, you know, certainly I said before, this is a mysterious disease for so many. Uh, I was among them, and this has been enlightening, and I think for a lot of people at home, they'll feel the same way. So again, thanks to all of you for being a part of this. You've done a lot of good uh, for a lot of people seeing this today. I want to point out, too, this entire program will be on our website, WNYT.com. So if there was a piece of this that you saw and you're like, wait, what did they say? I want to get them, just go back to the website and check it out. Also, we'll have a link right to the Alzheimer's Association website. So some of those resources that you talked about, you can find links to how to make those uh, happen for yourself and for your loved ones. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was our pleasure to bring this program to you about Alzheimer's, uh, sharing the journey, and thank you all for sharing the journey with us and our viewers. Have a good one.